3.7, we're going to talk about human population dynamics. Um, we're going to talk about how populations experience growth and decline. Uh, this PowerPoint also is going to have the math of it. So don't get scared, but math is coming. So just prepare yourself. All right, birth rates, infant mortality rates, and overall death rates, access to family planning, access to good nutrition, access to education, postponement of marriage, all these things are going to affect whether the human population is growing or declining. It's kind of re repeat, I suppose, from the uh, TFR PowerPoint. But if we see um, things like, if we're trying to determine if that population is growing or declining, uh, which we can get from the age structure diagrams, that can then tell us, kind of give us a general idea of what this is. So let's say we have an inverted pyramid. That's going to tell us that birth rate's very low, the infant mortality rate is really low, overall death rate's pretty low, a lot of family planning, a lot of good nutrition, a lot of education, um, being married in later years, and then if we have a, re the, a normal pyramid with a really wide base, it would tell us the exact opposite. Factors limiting global human population include our caring capacity and the basic factors that limit human population growth as set forth by Malthusian theory. So Mal Thomas Malthus was this really important smart guy, or in some time, I suppose it's not really relevant. Um, he's like, yo, this will be a point where um, we're not going to have enough resources for everybody. And he put it all together in this very complicated graph that our resources are only increasing linearly, but uh, our population's growing exponentially. So there's going to be this point called, in very just, you know, bleh words, I feel like this could be a much cooler name, but he's like, the point of crisis. And after this point of crisis, we're going to have, you know, like, everything explode and apocalypse happen. Um, there's not going to be enough resources for the people that we have, and then they'll die off, and that's very sad. So, for example, you know, fresh water is a limiting resource, and when we run out of water, not only will people not have enough water to drink, but it's also going to decrease food production. And so we're going to see even more famine happen, and that's lots more death. So this is kind of a scary idea. Um, to be sure. And it's kind of one of the things where we don't really know when this point of crisis will be, if we've already hit it, um, because we don't know what our carrying capacity is. Uh, there's been so many advances in human technology, and so there's also a lot of people that are optimistic, like, you know, I think that uh, after so many years, we're just going to have more and more technology, and we're just going to get better at feeding people. And then those people will be like, well, you know, I don't think we'll ever have the carrying capacity because X, Y, Z. And then there's people who are like, uh, no, no, we hit our carrying capacity back at like 2 billion and we're just, we haven't seen the effects yet or we are seeing the effects. You know, there's people out there that are starving, but then you would argue, but no, they're, they're not starving because of lack of food. They're starving because of lack of distribution. And so it's just, it's so many arguments that, you know, so who knows, honestly, who knows? But this is what Malthus thought. <laughs> All right, moving on um, to density independent and density dependent factors. That's something we talked about for a brief second in Cats Borneo. The density independent factors are things that are going to affect a population no matter what the size is. So if it's a small population or a large population, they're equally um, impacted by a storm or fire or a heat wave or a drought. So something that's widespread, it doesn't matter if there's a few or a lot, it has no impact on the individual's success. Density dependent factor is where an individual's success or vulnerability is affected by the number of individuals in that population. So the amount of water, the access to fresh air, the amount of food, uh, disease transmission. So it's like if there's more individuals, that means the disease can get around faster. And so by being around more individuals, you are then at risk of, or you're higher, you're at a higher risk of getting that disease um, or territory size. So all these things are affected by the size of the population. So we call that density dependent factors. Yay, getting into the math. All right, the first we're going to talk about is the rule of 70. It says that 
the number 70 divided by the percentage growth rate is going to tell you the population's doubling time or how many years it takes for that population to exactly double in size. It is always, always, always going to be 70. That's why it's the rule of 70. Uh, I knew why for about five minutes and then I forgot. Um, so if you want to know more, just talk to a statistics teacher. They will tell you why it's 70. I am not a statistics teacher. I just know the bare minimum of math that you need to know for this class. That sounds kind of bad. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm not a math teacher. So there you go. Uh, so for example, currently we have a population growth rate of 0.7%. So if that was unchanged, to figure out how many years it would take for our population to double, we would just do 70 divided by 0.7. That tells us the doubling time is 100 years, so it would take 100 years for our population to exactly double in size. So if that stays the same, and that's a big if because there's a lot of factors that go into population growth rate, and that's why it's constantly changing. But if in this hypothetical little world, then that would double in 2119. Crude growth rate just looks at crude death rate and crude birth rate and the difference between the two. Uh, crude de death rate is the number of individuals that die per 1,000, and crude birth rate is the number of individuals that are born per 1,000 people. Um, so if we had a problem that said if 35 people were born every 1,000, that is our crude birth rate, um, or CBR, and the death rate was 1%, what is the crude growth rate? So to figure out the crude growth rate, we need both the crude death rate and the crude birth rate, but we're only given the crude birth rate directly. So then we also had to figure out what the crude death rate is, but we can do that really, really easily just by dropping this little percent. Percent just means per 100. So 1% means 1 per 100. And then we just have to do a little quick math to figure out how many that is per 1,000. We just multiply each side by 10, and that tells us if one person is dies for 100 people, that means 10 people are going to die for every 1,000 people. And then we just find the difference, and that tells us you know, we're about growing by 25 people per 1,000. We can then change that into a percent by just dividing it by 10. Um, and that has to do with this is per 1,000, this is per 1,000, but then to change that into a percent, you can multiply it by, or like, ugh, you divide it by 10 to get it to per 100. There we go. Um, so it's kind of going the opposite way of what I just did. So let's say the CBR is 36 and the CDR is 9. To figure out what the natural net annual percent increase is, you would just get the um, the crude growth rate and then just divide it by 10 and that gives you the percent increase. So this is saying that 27 people are born, or are not born, but like the population is growing by 27 per 1,000 people or it's growing at a rate of 2.7%. Going back a little bit more, um, or zooming back a bit more, we can also look at how many people are moving in and out of a country, and then to get a better idea of the population growth rate, then we factor that in because it's going to tell us more specifically what's happening. So we, when we're looking at immigration and emigration, we want to look at, to see how many people are populations growing by. You get that by either being born or by moving there. How many, and then how many people are leaving. You leave a population by either dying or physically moving away. And then you divide it by the population size and then multiply it by 100 to get it into a percent. So if a city population uh, 15,250 has 200 people being born, 50 dying, 20 immigrating and 30 emigrating in the course of a year. What is its net annual percentage growth rate? We add up the people that are entering, add up the people that are leaving, find the difference between the two, divide it by the total, and multiply it by 100 in order to get into a percent. Whew. Oh, and then this one is the scariest, but this year you get to have a calculator on the AP test. Brand new. Congratulations. They finally caught up with society. So to figure out um, a future population, we would take the initial population, multiply it by E, which is this magic number that should be in your calculator, but if it's not in your calculator because 
I don't know, whatever reason, get a really basic calculator, which is fine. Uh, and you just have to memorize the 2.72. If you look it up, it's a really big number, but 2.72 will get you close enough. You do not have to know why it's E. I don't know why it's E. It's something like Euler's number. I don't know. Another thing I knew for five minutes, and then I forgot because it just wasn't important. And then you raise it to the rate of growth, which you have to convert it into a decimal. So it's not like the rule of 70. Rule of 70, you keep it as a percent, but then with this fancy one, you have to change into a decimal. I'm sorry, it's annoying. And then multiply it by the time frame, and then ta-da, that gives you the final population. Let's say we have a country with 200 million people. The growth rate is 2.5%. Assuming that stays constant, what would the population of this country be in 50 years? Um, we know it's a different formula than the doubling time because the doubling time it tells us like how many years would it be before this population is so much. Um, so what tells us we have to use this crazy formula is it gives us a much more specific time frame. So we take our initial population, multiply by E raised to 0 0.025, which is the 2.5% times 50 years. And so in 50 years, it's going to be just over 698 people if the population growth rate remains the same. And last formula, I'm pretty sure, maybe, uh, is population density. Population density is going to tell us also about living conditions. So you just take the number of individuals divided by the area and... Just make sure to tack on that unit. So let's say we have 125 million people, inhabit 250 square miles. The population density would be 500,000 people per square mile, which, yes, I realize it's extremely unrealistic, but I was just typing out numbers and then I saw that it was not going to happen. And I'm like, eh, I'm not going to change it. That's, yeah, I'm just going to leave it as it is. Uh, but yeah, if you do get a number like that, that's not realistic. So you probably did something wrong. Because if it's like a college board question, they're not going to put an unrealistic question. But I am because I felt like it. <laughs> All right, last thing that I want to mention um, as far as the human population dynamics. Uh, in the future, we're going to see the most population growth happening in Africa and Asia because um, currently they are the continents with the higher higher growth rates um, but we'll see more of a decrease in countries like Europe where all of them have a percentage not all of them but a lot of them sorry have a population growth that is below zero so yep the end now I'll go ahead and explain how populations experience growth and decline <laughs>